According to a recent report by the European Cultural and Creative Industries Alliance, the European luxury sector, which is 70% of the global luxury market, employs over 1.5 million people directly. It is responsible for over 414 billion euros in revenues, over 3% of Europe's entire GDP, 10% of exports, and over 110 billion euros in taxes annually. At the same time, the ECCIA put a number on the risk to Europe's economy if the luxury sector isn't properly protected. An increase in IP infringements could result in a loss of 43 to 79 billion euros, between 100 and 180,000 jobs, and between 14 and 26 billion euros in taxes. An increase in trade and non-trade barriers in key markets could reduce output by between 2 and 3.4 billion and risk up to 1 billion in taxes. It's an industry which is uh, uh, displaying a very positive image of the countries uh, where the luxury brands are, uh, are were born, and it's uh, a, an industry which usually uh, is profitable and providing taxable uh, incomes and duties to the economies where it, where it operates. Once regarded as the cherry on the cake of the textile and manufacturing sectors, luxury has become a core industry in Europe and the power dynamic between the sector and the central governments that now love it has irrevocably changed. It's no coincidence that the Italian Strategic Investment Fund recently created a 2 billion euro joint venture with Qatar Holdings specifically to invest in Made in Italy brands. The Made in Italy, which uh, includes in the perimeter uh, fashion brands, food and food distribution, design and uh, uh, leisure, tourism, it's a very important part of the Italian economy. It's around 15% of the total direct and indirect employment rate, um, 10%, uh, approximately 10% of GDP, and it does account, uh, according to the most recent data, to more than 30% of Italian exports. Indeed, as the made-in appellation becomes ever more important, especially in emerging markets from Asia to Latin America, products are increasingly acting as quasi-national emblems, souvenirs of heritage and history and skills that were cultivated over centuries. The reflection with the, the Fung family was to say maybe we can put together something which is going to, to marry the best of the two worlds on the east and the west and uh, where we can uh, benefit each other. Coming from, uh, let's say, Europe, uh, the idea of know-how, uh, substance, identity, etc. Uh, married to what we have in the East at the moment, which is a sense of future, d dynamism, money, new territories, new frontiers. Flexing its new muscle, luxury is uniting together as never before, working to promote new trade agreements, intellectual property legislation and immigration reform to promote tourism and protect its roots going forward. What we'd like to see is that we'd like to see a one-stop shop where um, people who are coming to Europe could put in their passport and apply in parallel for both the Schengen and for a visa to visit the UK. The overall estimate is that we're missing out on about a billion pounds, so it's tens of thousands of jobs. At the same time, it's taking more responsibility for preserving cultural heritage beyond its own, stepping into the gap as cash-strapped municipalities shift funds from the arts to infrastructure, building new factories to keep jobs in country. Savile Row, um, has helped, I think, um, energise British menswear, if you like. Um, I mean, we've got this wonderful uh, cloth industry up in Yorkshire and so on, which has actually been going through uh, pretty good times recently. Um, some 90% of what we use in, on Savile Row is, is from Yorkshire. So I think it's, it's all sort of come together to help this homegrown industry, if you like. How this will develop is unclear, but one thing is certain. As the recession in Europe shows no signs of abating, the luxury industry will continue to emerge as a power player, not just behind the scenes, but front and center on the global stage. Vanessa Friedman, Financial Times, Vienna.